Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our own minute sphere. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. Across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as our minds are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes. And surely, drew their plans against us. Hello, I'm Orson Welles, and I've been quoting from another Welles, no relation, H.G. Wells, the distinguished novelist, historian, prophet, who was also the great master of science fiction. He wrote The War of the Worlds, on which was based a certain notorious radio broadcast, which as some of you may remember, sent many thousands of our listeners panicking into the streets all over the country. H.G. denounced me for doing it, but later when he realized that our broadcast, like his story, was not intended to cause riots, but just to entertain. We got to be good friends, and I was forgiven. Whether all those people who jammed the highways and even took to the hills to escape the Martians have forgiven me is another matter. This is it. We thought that this was it. Listening to that show, uh, I said we were very impressionable at that age because of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and uh, that really made a big impression on us. One fellow in particular who owned a store took the money from his cash register and loaded his car up with food and took off for the mountains and left his wife and children at home. New York City was just demolished and they were uh, uh, coming closer. All of New J North Jersey is an inferno, and they are proceeding south. I conceive, can conceive of no nightmare as terrifying as establishing such communication with the so-called superior, or if you wish, advanced technology in outer space. George Wald, is a Nobel Prize winning biologist. One of a group of distinguished scientists meeting on the subject of extraterrestrial life. All of the people you will be seeing in this program, scientists, radio listeners, Orson Welles, have one thing in common. Each has had reason to believe in the likely existence of non-earthly life in the universe. I, uh I think there's no question but that we live in an inhabited universe that has life all over it. What I'm imagining is the facts that I've just stated becoming generally known so that uh, people know that out there is a million other civilizations, they all look fabulously ugly and they're all a lot smarter than us. That seems to me useful and a character building experience for mankind. From the monstrous Mars life of his famous broadcast, Orson Welles will be taking us through science fiction to science fact, to the new view of extraterrestrial life now emerging from probes to the planets, interstellar discoveries, and findings about the nature of life itself. A real picture as astonishing in its way as the science fiction of 1938. If there is, life out there, intelligent life, how did we ever get the notion that it might be otherwise than friendly? 
Well, Mars, of course, is the god of war, so the planet bearing his name might be expected to have warlike intentions. In our broadcast, the Martians were as aggressive and ruthless as any human being. <laughs> Ridiculous assumption on the face of it. They were supposedly as bad as we are, at our worst, and also much uglier. They brandished death rays in their slimy tentacles. And for a while, at least, just toward the end of the radio play, they appeared to be totally invincible. What finally stopped them? Well, here's the way it went. In the words of the mythical Professor Pearson of Princeton, who was our commentator, I remember, he said, writing in his journal when the whole thing was put together again and the world was in business, I remember wandering through Manhattan, standing alone on Times Square, and catching sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in its jaws. I walked up Broadway, past silent shop windows, and suddenly I caught sight of a Martian machine. And then across Columbus Circle, I could see standing in a silent row 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. And I looked for the monsters that inhabit those machines. And then, before my eyes, I saw them stark and silent. The Martians themselves, with a flock of hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. And later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they had been killed by disease bacteria, against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all man's defenses had failed, by the humblest thing that God in his wisdom had put upon this earth, the common cold. That's the way it was. Well, quite a lot of things have happened in the world since then. An invasion from the planet Mars, that at least is one thing that didn't happen. But in a way, you know, we have been invading Mars. If Mars hasn't exactly been invaded, well, it's certainly been investigated, not attacked, but thoroughly, very thoroughly studied. Observations of Mars had begun long before our broadcast, and even back then in 1938, it seemed plausible to many people that life could have developed on Mars, just as it had on Earth. Peering through telescopes, scientists had seen what? Well, first a planet that, like our own Earth, and polar ice caps. They were fascinated to see that the ice caps grew and receded with each year. Large areas changed color with the seasons. Did that mean vegetation? Straight lines were sighted on the planet's surface. Some called them canals. The American astronomer Percival Lowell believed that these Martian canals had been created by an advanced technological civilization. First in 1965 and then again in 1969, NASA sent spacecraft to fly by Mars and send back scientific measurements and close-up photographs. This is picture 21, a red picture, wide-angle picture, fantastic picture. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Look at those little craters. This is a narrow-angle camera view. The Mariner missions were great achievements for the scientists. But the pictures of Mars showed a world of total desolation. 
Was Mars less like the Earth then and more like the Moon? There were no canals, no cities, no areas of cultivation, no signs of upheaval or layering in the Martian crust to indicate that the planet was active or evolving geologically. The pictures revealed no volcanoes to spew out gases that could enrich the atmosphere. And water, so essential to life, seemed to be present only in traces. The atmosphere was so thin as to make the possibility of life seem even more remote. For the fans of science fiction, not very exciting. But for scientists, the whole excitement is finding out the facts. That's the whole name of the game. Now these first flybys had revealed only some of the facts. But all the same, the exploration of Mars and of all the other planets of the solar system was actually getting underway. I can't, I can't feel that any person with any soul can look out on that universe that surrounds us and can imagine the immensity of it and the history of it without being rather impressed with the idea that we as little atoms made of the same stuff those stars are made of have the capability to regard the other part of the universe. One piece of the universe has the ability to look at another part of the universe and wonder about it. That's a very amazing thing and it brings into one's mind all kinds of thoughts about religion and philosophy and so on. But don't ask me about life on Mars, okay? In the fictional Martian story in the War of the Worlds, it was understood that the Martians were fighting for their own survival. Their planet was growing so cold and inhospitable that they might perish if they remained. Well, real life confined to such a planet would fight for survival by trying to change itself, by evolving. Every living thing on Earth has evolved from the lowly, the invisibly small microbe. Given nourishment, the microbe will grow colonies so vast that they rapidly become visible to the eye. Here on our planet, microbes have adapted to survive the most hostile conditions. Arid deserts, the frozen Himalayas, in trenches under thousands of tons of pressure in the ocean deeps. Biologists at Ames Laboratory are discovering adaptive capabilities in life forms that a few years ago would have been regarded as fantastic. Within the cooling systems of atomic reactors, organisms have been discovered flourishing where radiation could be expected to destroy any living thing. In hospitals that use ultraviolet for sterilization, strains have been found resistant to the killing radiation. Biologists are growing organisms in salt solutions, in acids, in alkalines, in ammonia gas, in boiling hot springs, in ice that is thawed for part of every day. In the vacuum of a space simulator, life forms have been flourishing for years without oxygen. Scientists are studying the kinds of environments that could challenge life forms on the planets and moons of the solar system. In 1971, Mariner 9 arrived at Mars, equipped to go into orbit and stay for a while. A good thing, too, because when it arrived, Mars' surface was obscured by a global dust storm. As the storm abated, a whole new Mars began to make its appearance. The first feature that swam into view, poking up through the dust, appeared to be a across an immense ethereal gulf. Minds that are to our minds, as our minds are to the beasts in the jungle. Intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic regarded this earth with envious eyes. And surely,
through their plans against us. Hello, I'm Orson Welles, and I've been quoting from another Welles, no relation, H.G. Wells, the distinguished novelist, historian, prophet, who was also... Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our own minute sphere. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. 